after Prince passed, Carolyn Palmer, writer for the Star Tribune, started asking questions about his involvement in the dance community. And that article, when it came out, we were really inspired by and getting to know more about Prince's story. Um, he's influenced so much internationally, but to know how deep his roots are locally, I wanted to take some time and uh, I invited uh, Ashley Selmer from Shapeshift to be the co-host for the event today so that, um, because I never met Prince, I can talk about stories about how Prince influenced me, but really hearing from those who were really close to our artistic practice and have known him for, um, through his work for a long time. So I'm gonna pass it over to Ashley. This always has to come down for me. <laughs> Never gets old. Okay, hi everyone. How are you today? A little audio clip here? Yeah, so let's, yeah, let's play it. Let's, that's okay. So we do have a, an audio um, clip from Caroline Palmer, again, who wrote the article on Prince and Dance in May. Check that out if you haven't seen it online. Um, she couldn't be here today, so we're gonna go ahead and play this clip of her. Hi everyone, this is Caroline. Sorry I couldn't join you today. I had to uh, head off to Detroit for a conference for work. And I'm really sorry to miss the conversation. I felt really fortunate to be able to put together an article for the Star Tribune on Prince's legacy and dance, and had heard a lot about um, his connection with the Minnesota Dance Theater, but actually didn't realize how deep his connections went until I started to talk to people. And the more people I talked to, the more they said, you should talk to somebody else and somebody else. And really, I could have gone on for many, many more interviews with people who um, engaged with Prince in a variety of ways through dance. He really did make an influence on um, so many different types of art forms. And with dance, what we saw was somebody who um, could move with absolute um, grace and sexiness. And um, he really was able to uh, bring other people in um, to engage with his music through movement. I wish I could be there again to engage in the conversation today. I hope it goes well. And uh, thank you again for joining together to talk about Prince's legacy and movement. Okay, so um, again, we're really grateful to Caroline and that article because it did inspire um, our lecture series today. And um, for me, it was awesome to check it out because just when we think we know everything about uh, dance, we find out that there's so many more influences and inspirations from so many other people, um, just like Prince. Um, and in particular, I do want to note what's great about the article is that um, it does show that not only did Prince find his voice in Minneapolis, but also his moves. Um, and there was this really strong correlation between Prince um, finding that dancers have this strong work ethic, just like um, musicians do. So there was this really neat um, pairing with that. Um, so again, I say welcome, purple people. I say purple people because you know Prince, uh, Prince's uh, energy just really uh, glowed so enormously in this city um, for everyone and its loyalty and love of all things Prince. So thank you to Michelle for having me here today and all of you being here. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ashley Selmer. I'm a dancer, choreographer, and director here for a company called Shapeshift. Um, we've been housed in the Kohl Center for the last two seasons. Um, so this space is really special to me uh, and I know what it means for the arts and for all of our other dance and art communities. Um, so with the loss of Prince and his investment in the community and local dance scene, we are devoting this lecture to remembering him and how those influences have shaped us today in our work. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about why I am so connected to Prince and how he has helped shape my work. So, as I'm sure many of you have learned, um, Prince shaped a lot of opportunities for young folks. He took um, a lot of attention to invest in, in them and um, their needs, whether it was indirectly, directly, behind closed doors, or publicly. And I feel like I'm one of those people. 
So my parents raised me on Prince tunes and other contributors to the Minneapolis sound that defined that era. So early on, um, my parents always played a lot of his music, and um, it was something that was just always on in the house. So my dad, who is an attorney, he actually worked directly and indirectly with other artists in the mid-80s and 90s. And fast forward to a couple years ago, 2013, um, I received an invite to Paisley Park um, from another dancer. Uh, you can imagine when I got this call, I thought it was not real. <laughs> um, but I said, hey, if this is an opportunity, I'm going to take the chance. So I was ecstatic and couldn't turn it down. And that night, we all headed over, about four or five of us in the dance community. We headed over to Paisley Park. And um, it was incredible. So we walked in. And we were immediately greeted by Joshua Welton. He's a director that has worked with Prince and a choreographer. So he started teaching us all these dance moves. We started right away. There was no like meet and greet. It was just like, let's get started, right? So immediately we, um, as dancers, kind of locked into that focus mode and started learning the moves. Um, Prince was not uh, directly present, but he was in the shadows. So of course, we were making sure that our grooves were on point. We were feeling sexy and edgy and fun. And we were immediately challenged into getting into that professional mode. So after that day at Paisley Park, um, a few of us were invited by his team to then shoot a video with Third Eye Girl. Um, Third Eye Girl is a a uh, female rock group that he worked very closely with in developing their own sound, um, their own moves, and um, we got to shoot a video called uh, Love Out Loud. That was an unreleased music video um, that is yet to be shared with the public, but I do hope one day that it is seen. So we shot on East Lake Street, and I distinctly remember they had us um, posted up on a uh, a street where there was a big colorful graffiti wall. Um, so it was here that we didn't actually learn any choreography for this shoot, unlike our Paisley Park location. We just had to improv and we had to freestyle and we had to work with uh, Third Eyed Girl. And I remember what was so special about this moment was um, it kind of forced me to come out of my shell, find my own unique artistry, and do it in front of people in the business. So it kind of pushed me to become sort of my own um, artistic dancer. And what better than to have three amazing like rocker chicks encourage you and interact with you. So it was also kind of a place of empowerment um, for me as a young female artist. So after that day um, of our shoot on East Lake, we then shot again at Treehouse Records. Um, and it was fantastic. It was cool because we were surrounded by all of these influences through vinyl. So James Brown um, and other soulful artists. And so I think after seeing those images around me, all of us were just kind of like shooting up our level from a 5 to a 20 to just give it all that we could. So again, um, it was so spontaneous and so full of love. And I'm very grateful um, to Prince and his team for seeing a, a diverse group of young folks and continuing to have them involved. Um, and lastly, on a different note, after that shoot, um, this was probably the, the most uh, special memory I've had with him um, and his team. We were invited to his concert at Myth. Um, and we went in with the idea that we were just there to, to appreciate his music and to, to vibe out. And then it wasn't until about midway through the concert, I was standing next to a friend of mine and my cousin, who's also a former dancer. And Joshua came out, Prince's choreographer, and said, we want you guys up on stage. Let's go. And we said, wait, what? <laughs> we're not ready. <laughs> and he said, oh, you got to be ready. And I said, OK, I'm ready. <laughs> So, of course, you like rack your brain for, okay, what should I do? Like, Prince is right here on his keyboard. Like, I don't want to make a fool out of myself. This is my time to shine. And I really do remember in that moment thinking, thank you, Prince, for allowing me up on this stage with the greats and with these amazing folks because um, it really pushed me out of my shell. It made it a very special moment for me in the Twin Cities community.
So as we stood up on that stage, we improved, we looked over at the other artists and jammed with each other, and everybody's face was just so full of life and love. And I know everyone walked away with a story just like I did that day about Prince. Um, and it just became a forever memory for me, which now influences me in my work with Shapeshift and my other independent dance projects. So as we speak about influences, we talk about Prince and his direct influences, um, how he influences me. But I'm also influenced by other things like my daily interactions with folks, poetry, thrifting, Twyla Tharp, Bill T. Jones. There's a constant circle of all of these different types of colors and textures and people and conversations and dialogues, which I feel too is what Prince was inspired by and why he was so loyal to our community and to bringing other people into his world, even if it wasn't this direct conversation and interaction. So I will not talk any further and pass the mic off to our next speaker, but I think most importantly, it's great to be a part of this lecture because um, I'm an 80s baby, so it's kind of, it's interesting. I feel like there's such a younger generation that has so much, uh, so many things to say about Prince, and so it's great to be able to have a platform and a dialogue to speak about it. How is this map going? Awesome. Look at you. <laughs> Fast. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so thank you again for being here. I'm going to pass it off to our next speaker, Craig, um, and welcome. Yeah. <laughs> you need a bigger, it's a taller mic stand or something. How's everybody? Um, so, hopefully, this is going to work here. So, uh, my name is Craig Rice. Um, I'm from, originally from the Twin Cities, and I'm, I was born in St. Paul and raised in St. Paul in Minneapolis, so I'm kind of really a Twin City. And, um, my background, just so I give you my background first, and then I'll kind of talk about specific things. That I, my background is sort of in the arts, but primarily um, music is really kind of, I started out young, um, maybe too young sometimes about being in the music industry, but I was lucky enough to play with some really serious musicians. And one of those people um, that I got involved with was really close to the, the Anderson family, which and ended up playing with an Ander Mrs. Anderson really took people on the north side uh, who wanted to be musicians and really opened up the house. And we were always looking for places to play, and she really opened it up. And uh, out of that, uh, that's when I first met Andre um, Simone, who was Andre Anderson originally. Um, his, co his cousins and brothers and I played together. And in that process, this was in the early 70s, there was this kid um, who, who everybody was talking about who actually was ultimately staying at the house and he was playing with Andre who was younger. Um, I knew about them, but you know, they're kids and so they would sometimes come and watch us rehearse. It was just like, get back kid, you know, you're bothering me kind of scenario. Um, segue, in the mid 70s I stopped playing, went to college, became a filmmaker, went to USC Film School, got my degree in film um, directing and producing was in New York, um, got a call from somebody else I went to school with. He said, I'm coming to Minneapolis to work on a film with this kid, and he couldn't remember his name. And I said, they're making a movie in Minneapolis with somebody, the musician, who is it? Who is it? He said, well, I think his name is like Prince or something like that. I said, oh, Prince, is, they're making a movie with him? I mean, what would they, why would they do that? So he said, do you want to be, I had been trained as an assistant director. He said, would you like to come back and work as assistant director on the movie? And I said, sure, you know. So I came back here. It was a very good experience for me in the sense that it, um, nobody else not really involved in the film had ever made a film before. One of the things that really came out of that was that I having worked in LA and worked in New York in production, um, the, the film and TV board in Minnesota really had not been a functioning organization. It had been established, but it had to do ordinary people, but it was too late. Ordinary people got shot in Chicago. It kind of laid dormant for a while. Um, and so we really had to figure out how do we make films in Minnesota? And in order to do that, we needed to establish this because Prince had a vision for filmmaking beyond music. So we realized we had to create an organization that still exists today and build it up so that it would continue to make productions over the years. Um, once we did that, Prince and I, uh, because part of my responsibility for Purple Rain was because everybody, he knew who I was because he remembered 
from years ago that my responsibility became talent. I was responsible for all the musical talent, all the extras, all the actors. So it was just corralling them. So I became very close with the time, very close with Andre again, um, Dez, obviously Prince and the Revolution. Um, and in, in that process, um, as I was going to go back to New York, it was like, he said, you know, you should really come to work for me in the music industry. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. Um, so I went back to New York, but I, he kept calling me and said, I, I'm going to, I want you to be my road manager for the Purple Rain Tour. I said, no. The third time he called, you know, I said, yes. And I ended up coming back, working on that. I became the road manager on that tour, which was a phenomenal situation. In that process, though, um, I didn't... Being a road manager was an incredible opportunity, but he had a vision to build a facility and to make movies, and, and so... Uh, and I, he was going to make Under the Cherry Moon, and I didn't want to do that. He said, well, I want to start a record company, so find some artists. And so um, I found a group called Maserati, which uh, ended up being on his first artist on Paisley Park label. I managed them for a while. Then I found another artist, which had been the lead singer at the time, which was Alexander O'Neill, which is how I know this young lady here. Her, her father was Alexander O'Neill's attorney plus another group, uh, Exotic Storm, which is all her father. Her father was a huge music, music business attorney here in town. Um, so it became an organization that we started managing groups, so I started doing all these bands. Then Terry and Jimmy were still here, so I started working with Flight Time to establish that. That's when Janet Jackson and George Michaels and all the people that they manage or worked with recording artist-wise. Then went on to, um, after a while, I decided that um, management was not kind of what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, so, and then Prince said, <laughs> I've got, we built the building, the Paisley Park, I need to run it. He said, what do you think of this? I said, this is a creative battleship. Paisley Park can be a creative battleship. Every square foot of this place is creativity. So I ran Paisley Park for a number of years and made associations with, I mean, an incredible group of people. Um, he was always, for me, because we talked he and I talked a lot about vision and imagery. Um, I, I, how I know Lois Holton here, because he took lessons from the Minnesota Dance Theater, and with her specifically, you know, Johnny Command, who unfortunately is not here. He was another incredible choreographer. We looked, and he said, I need another choreographer. I had known Otis Salid, who did Fame, um, the, the TV series, and I brought him in here to work with us for a while. Uh, because dance was so important. I did a video for him. If you ever get a chance to see a video that I did called Scandalous, it's just him. If, if it had been today, and it's a, almost like a one take. I watched this man. He said, I want to do one performance, only me. And I said, we said, how do you want to do that? He says, I want it to be sort of a classic dance piece. And uh, so he said, so we, he said, how, I, so we talked about this. And I said, so what do you want to do? And he said, um, let's get videos of dancers. So it was Jackie Wilson, and I mean, it was like um, Fred Astaire and, and, and um, Gene Kelly. So we got all these videos and watched all these videos, and he came up with a, a whole dance sequence. And I watched him practice. I was like, I had never seen anybody actually look at something and pick up and, and practice and practice and practice and practice so he could actually do three and a half minutes performance by himself, just dancing and singing. Um, it was it was amazing thing for me. So the, his dance part was great. His his music is obviously I don't even t need to talk about that because that's in a whole other world. But his visual sense was so strong, from photography to dance to to performances, was, and his stage presence was what it was about. People say, what did I learn from Prince? As an artist, what I learned from Prince is that you have to ch you have to check yourself. Is this the best you can do? You have to ask yourself that from an objective standpoint, not I did it so it must be great, but is what you did the best you could do? You know, is there something more? Can you push yourself some more? How much more can you do, you know? And then really step back and say that I'm doing this for, for an audience. It's not about me. I know some artists think that it's a, it's a communication of yourself to people, but really it's, it's for the people. Those are the most important people out there. I think that one of the things that he taught me from a business standpoint was, again, the audience is the most important thing. One time, he hated being late in, in for performance levels. He didn't mind it being late in regular life, but on performance, it was about the audience. We one time were having a show, and the electronic curtain wouldn't go up in time. And he said, it's, it's time to start the show. I said, well, they can't get the curtain up, so we got to get it fixed. He says, it's time to start the show. I said, yes, I know, but the drape won't go up 
Prince, it won't, it, I mean, I said, trust me, it won't go out. He said, then cut it down, we have to start. And I said, that's $35,000, we can't just cut the thing. Said, I said, if we cut it down, we'll never get it back up again for the next show, because we're gonna have to do this again. He said, I don't care, cut it down, it's about the audience. So luckily, as I was stalling, and I'm not gonna lie, because few people know I was actually walking very slowly to the stage to, to do this. Luckily, the guys come right here, we got it, we got it, we, 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 we can crank it up by hand, and we'll figure it out later, so I said, thank God, so that I could go back and say, okay, it's, it's ready, we can go, but to that, he would lose money to make a better experience for the audience, that is what really is art, art is about, not about you, but about what you give to other people. So from my standpoint, that for me was what he gave me, and I think he's given to this community and to this town. We in our, our lives have been lucky enough to experience an artist probably never again in our lifetime will we witness somebody who was solely committed to the creative process like we have with Prince. We were lucky enough to have him live in our community and stay in our community so that he inspires us from this point in time on. Thank you. And the mic comes back down. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Lynch. Um, artistically, I go by Miss Britt. I am born and raised here in the Twin Cities. I'm a spoken word artist and actress, DJ, a small business owner, and TV and radio host. So I wear many hats, um, all of them inspired by the greatness that I've experienced here in the Twin Cities, um, especially by Prince. Uh, my un first introduction to Prince came through my mother. Um, I was raised by a single parent, um, so there were no men in the house, but there was Prince. <laughs> Prince was the, the, the man in our house um, in many ways, and so literally my first introductions to music, to sound, were his albums or cassette tapes, um, and it is a sense of home for me that I'll always have. When you think back to your earliest childhood moments and you know whether it's a holiday or just hanging out with your mom as a child, I will always have certain Prince songs that take me back to being five years old, three years old, at whatever age, um, and remembering the way my mom would fan out about Prince gave me permission to just completely feel music and be unapologetic about the way that it made me feel. Um, so that was my first introduction to Prince. Because I was born and raised in the Twin Cities and so much of my family is from here as well, there were moments where um, he, even though he was this big, huge star, he always seemed just one degree away. I had an aunt that went to high school with him. My family is Seventh-day Adventist, and Prince was at one point a Seventh-day Adventist, and so my great-grandmother actually gave him Bible study lessons <laughs> and his siblings, which I didn't learn until, yeah, it's sliding on me. Didn't learn until years later, um, but it's just a testament to he always just seemed like one degree away. As a performer growing up, I attended the Lundstrom Center of Performing Arts, and I can remember one of my uh, earlier performances, we had Bobby Z playing the drums for us, and our instructors told us, now he works with Prince, he works with real professionals, so you guys gotta get in line, and we're like eight years old, and we're like, okay, we can do this, you know? And I'm thinking to myself, well, if I'm this age and I'm working with princess people, like I'm going places, you know? Like, let me not mess this performance up. By the time I'm 10 and like double digits, I'll be working with Prince because I'm halfway there already. Um, so he was always very real to me, even though he's the biggest star I've ever experienced in my lifetime. Um, as a result of being from here and having access to Paisley Park, um, I was one of those people who was always there hanging out at his dance parties. Even if he wasn't there, there was something about um, the mystery that he gave, him being so elusive. You're sh you get an invitation to Paisley Park, you hear there's a dance party, you don't find out until like an hour before, so you literally cancel all your plans, you get dressed, you drive all the way out there, and you stand in line, you put your phone away, and, you know, we knew the whole policy, and half the time we'd go and Prince wouldn't be there. <laughs> or he would be there and he'd be sitting upstairs kind of observing, just watching other people party, um, or giving other emerging artists an opportunity to perform, 
or he would trick us and, you know, there'd be some, at one time they said, Prince performing live and something. And I'm like, oh, I get to see him perform this time. And we got there and he played a DVD of him performing. <laughs> And it was amazing. It was like him in Paris in the 70s. It was a performance I hadn't seen, and we still loved it just the same. But it was um, the sense of humor and the, um, you know, the invitation to be in his space still made it very personal. And then, you know, you're like, oh, he's not here, whatever. We'll just have a good time and party anyway. And then the next thing you know, he walks by, or you look up, and he's just sitting there, um, it was always amazing to see how someone so big and so well-known around the world could be the guy that's sitting in the chair next to you, um, and then you turn around and he's gone, because like I said, he was very elusive. Um, and I learned so much from, from him as far as what it means to cultivate space. You know, he's done so much for the community in a way that was often anonymous. He didn't have to open up his doors to any of us. He didn't have to give us those moments of performances that he hadn't released to the public in other formats. He didn't have to give the emerging artists their opportunity to perform, but he did. And I think that spoke to his character and also um, that it doesn't matter what level of success you attain in your life, you still have a responsibility to community and you still have a responsibility to culture, cultivating culture and nurturing other people so that there's a legacy. It doesn't just end with you. So when we talk about Prince's legacy, one of the things I think about because of my great grandmother, I think of Prince and God and also his own articulations of God and spirituality. But then the way I was raised, like, sexuality, like, that's not even a word you can say out loud, you know, versus Prince owned it with every part of his being, yet was so spiritual at the same time. And what I learned after his passing, hearing from other artists who spoke of what Prince did for them, Prince gave people permission to own their own bodies. So being in a dance space where people have the opportunity to have a profession in which they can articulate the expression and the feeling and the movement of their bodies without fear, for many people who aren't dancers, they never felt like they had that power until they saw Prince do something, some amazing dance move or some sexual reference or gesture that gave them permission to say, like, let's not make this a taboo thing. Let's say that we're adults who have complete ownership over ourselves and the way that we move and the way that we feel. And we don't have to apologize for our sexuality or say, because I love God, that I can't be a sexual being too. And that was really powerful to me. When I think about the legacy of Prince, um, I think about the generations of music that he's put out. Ashley articulated how there's so many younger artists even that, that know Prince and that you know sing along to his songs and dance to his music. For me, my mom introduced me to Prince, but fortunately, um, I was able to reintroduce my mom to Prince in a way that she had never had access to access before. Um, right before Prince passed, um, because I was going to Paisley Park so frequently, and because of some of the work I was doing in community, I would often get tickets to go to concerts at Paisley Park. And right before Prince passed, I was able to give my mom a pair of tickets to see Morris Day in the Time perform at Paisley Park. And a few uh, months later, I got tickets um, when Morris Day in the Park performed at the Minnesota Zoo, and because of um, some of my relationships, my mom and I got to dance on stage with Morris Day in the Time, you know, and this is who introduced me to the music, and now I'm introducing her to the actual people. Um, but if it wasn't for Prince continuing to cultivate space for artists to thrive and for people to go on and have their own successful careers out of them, this generational gift wouldn't have existed. So although I never got to meet Prince personally and neither did my mom, it very much so felt personal for me as I think it does for pretty much anyone in the Twin Cities. Um, the day that he died, um, for me, was the day I felt like I had to grow up. Like, I'm kind of adulting, I kind of know what I'm doing, most of the time I don't. But for, for whatever reason, that day, something hit me because growing up as a young performer from the Twin Cities, because I had performed with Bobby Z, I had equated Prince with a piece of my dream and didn't even know it. And so when Prince died, and I hadn't made it to that dream, 
or had that one-on-one -on -one connection with him or artistic mentorship or it, it, something switched in me, like, what, what are you doing with your time? I know Prince is human, obviously, because he was so close, but there was something so mystic about him that for a while I forgot he was human. But we all are human, and we're all going to have a time when, when we pass. So if there are things that we want to accomplish, things that we want to do, when are we going to make the time to do them? We can't treat our dreams or the people around us as if there are these things that will live on forever. Prince's music will live on forever. His legacy will live on forever, but that person isn't here anymore. And so for me, that was really the moment of our time is so short and so precious, but there's so much opportunity and there's so much work to be done. When you look at the Twin Cities artist scene and you see all of Prince's impact, everything from his philanthropy to his mentorship to the culture that he cultivated of, hey, let's put our phones down. Let's like see each other and be in this moment or, you know, let's just enjoy our dinner and not fan out. Like, let me sit up here and eat. You know, I've also had a, a lot of moments running into him at restaurants and other shows. And so I think about what is our role as people in the Twin Cities of power, as artists, um, as gatekeepers of people of privilege, whatever, however we identify, what can we be doing now that this person is no longer healed here because he did so many things you know, if we truly love and honor Prince, we can't just let all of those things go aside because, you know, we're sad or because we feel like we can't do what he did when each of us can take up a piece of that legacy and extend it, whether that is developing young artists or um, giving back and donating money to organizations that develop young artists, um, or whatever it is, whatever our gifts and talents um, and opportunities lend us to, Prince left us a, bl a blueprint of how to validate the Twin Cities artist scene. I think before his passing, there were a lot of young artists especially who felt like I have to leave Minnesota to make it. And I can, it just, it makes me so sad being from here. Imagine what it's like to grow up and feel like the place where you were developed and cultivated isn't going to allow you to live your dream, you know? And so for people who don't have access to leaving, feeling like their dreams aren't tangible as a result of us not being New York or LA or whatever. But seeing the way that the world responded to Prince, I think, after his passing especially, was a wake-up call to young artists especially to see he was from here, he stayed here, he worked here, he hired people from here, and look at his impact. You know, the pyramids in Egypt were lit up in purple, N NASA had a purple nebula, you know, like the river in Chicago was purple, everything around the world was purple for like a week because of one person who was from here. And that's incredibly powerful to tell a young person who felt like their dreams were invalid because they were from here too. So I just think that there is something so amazing about this space that we're in and that we're from and that we work in. And that just because we don't physically have the person, the energy, the spirit, the blueprint, all of that is still here. And so I'm incredibly excited for what the future holds for the Twin Cities artist community because I think we've had just an incredible inspiration and role model of what is possible. Um, and I'm incredibly excited about that. So I was actually asked by the TC Daily Planet to do a spoken word piece on Prince um, and to talk about our impact. And it may end up becoming one of those unreleased things because <laughs> uh, it was supposed to be out by now. But um, so we were going to show the video. But since the video is still not done, um, I will perform the poem instead. So this poem is an original piece I wrote called This Thing Called Life. And I wrote this because the day that Prince died, I, I went to Paisley Park, one, because I didn't believe it was true. Um, but then afterwards, I went to First Avenue. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know where else to go. And I'll never forget being in there that night. And it was the most packed I've ever seen it. And there's nothing but purple lights on. And they're playing his videos. And Purple Rain is playing. 
and folks are singing at the top of their lungs, strangers are hugging each other, and I'm standing in the middle of like a thousand people sobbing, like I had just got dumped on prom night or something. <laughs> and I, re I remember thinking like, this is the most jubilant morning ceremony I've ever attended. Because everyone else was dancing and singing and it was a very intense moment. I know everyone felt it, but I was the only one crying from what I could see. And I'm like, what am I missing? What has everyone else figured out in this moment that I have? Is this a departure of spirit or is this um, an awakening or an emerging or a beginning of something new? Is this a union of Prince's spirit into just a different realm of legend and legacy than what we've seen him before? And so I wrote this poem called, this thing called life. Sometimes weddings feel like funerals. Gatherings that are supposed to result in you gaining a loved one sometimes become the moments when you have to say goodbye to the one you once knew. So when given the invitation, will you look to the world through the lens of what used to be or see the present for what it is now? And when given the choice to change your perspective, what will you see at the altar? Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life, where in this lifetime, we stared into the endless galaxy and found a star in the not so distance who was sacred enough to show you that God is real without ever taking you to church, who burned into your imagination the divinity and carnal power of your body, who gave light to the possibility of unpronounceable names, now imagine, Waking up to see that star rise from your side of the sky every morning, big enough to be the sun. With endless time and revolutions, who gave us rhythm with ease, who was hot enough to set the world on fire. Imagine that star choosing to rise from your side of the sky every morning, a sky that many doubted, a sky that was never expected to produce stars at all, birthed the sun unapologetic of his origins because being from here mattered, orbiting so close that we could feel his matter, bending definitions no one asked for, expanding horizons without asking for permission, proving that you can stand in the light without giving up your darkness, your blackness, this sun, provided mirrors for which I could see a new part of myself. And there I was, staring at the altar, Mourning a close chapter, not considering that the story continued. Daily beloved, who am I to give my gift away? I watched the sun from my sky rise every morning, never questioning if he was bright enough, sharing his light with the world so I could dream, and there I was, choosing to be dim in fear of brilliance. Alive and not living at all, not accepting the fact that this thing called life is joy and pain, sometimes simultaneously and never in the order you assume. Like the day our dearly departed son found love and married a new galaxy, and I was completely unprepared for a reality that was bound to one day be. Perhaps because we fail to see someone's humanity when we see them living their dreams, but dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life where in our lifetime, the sun left behind his light for all of us to shine. And because of him, I too dream in violet and in rhyme, stretching myself and taking up space, knowing that it's mine because of him. They can underestimate the crop, but never our land and our sky. So cultivate your culture. Now is the time. The tale of two cities is in the palm of our hands because of him. We can stand at the altar, unapologetic of our stance, to cultivate your peace. Our composure during breakdowns is in the future that we write. So may we forever dream and manifest them in this thing called life. Thank you. So next part of our talk turns to everybody that's here and to share stories so that we can fill in some of the gaps in, in the map and, and just really touch on how, um, how Prince was part of our community and, and part of uh, the fabric that is uh, the Twin Cities. I mentioned that you know I've only been here 10 years and, and that first summer that I was here for 
July 7th of 07, 7707, he launched a tour and a perfume, and there's three shows, and there's, of course, the last minute edition of a First Avenue after, after, after concert. And um, he was supposed to, doors were supposed to open at 10 p.m., show was supposed to start at 11 p.m. We were still in line at 1 a.m., and we eventually got in at 2, and the show started at 3 a.m., and uh, it was running for an hour and a half before the, the police closed it down. I think they were just waiting, but anyways, I didn't see it happen, but when Prince got on stage, the only thing he had to say was, I hope you're ready, because we're gonna, we're gonna be here all night long. And that, that sense of like, the celebration of the performance, and that we were doing it together, was really clear in just that one statement. Um, I'd love for anybody else to kind of tell their Prince stories and, and where Prince touched them. And I'm gonna find more room on this. Kristen, can I turn it to you? Uh, oh, I, all I have to say <laughs> is before the after, after, after concert on 777, I got a call from Chris Schlichting about five minutes before the Target Center show was supposed to start. I said, let's go scalp some tickets. And I walked out my apartment door, showed up on the street. We got, uh, he didn't even open the doors until after the show was supposed to start. So a stadium's worth of people were on First Avenue. Um, and uh, uh, that was my one live Prince experience. It was magic. Yeah, to get into the after, after, after show at First Ave, I waited in line for 12 hours. And, yeah, and had, you know, on one side of me, somebody who was from Minnesota had grown up here and um, had stories about running the high school radio show and bringing Prince for some you know, a high school concert, um, uh, dance night, and then the person next to me was not from here, had, you know, spent her money and vacation time to come and participate and was following Prince around, had seen him in Paris, had seen him in Vegas, had, you know, was just, was just willing to, um, to go for the long haul, and that's what I remember from Prince's live performance. It, you didn't know when it would start, and you didn't know when it would end, but it would go for a long time. Um, I'm gonna shoot it over to Chris. I've enjoyed hearing your stories, too, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I grew up in the 80s, I listened to Prince, I had an, a, a second cousin who served as a bodyguard, for Prince, and I have a friend who served as a bodyguard. It feels like we all have connections. Um, saw him on a couple occasions, the, the 777 tour, the, out, the outside, I can't remember, in the parking lot over here. Um, Maceo Parker was in town for a concert. The sax player for James Brown had played at the Orpheum and then uh, went and played at Paisley Park, and, I, and we drove out to Paisley. That was the one time I saw him at Paisley Park, and I remember being in a room comparable to the size of this room, and uh, probably like 30 other people in the room just really relaxed and open, and, sta and Prince standing next to me, watching Maceo play for you know 20 minutes, but um, we didn't dare speak to him or approach him. Um, those were the rules, and then, but then he got up on stage and played for uh, you know hours after that. Um, and then I remember just a, a number of occasions at First Avenue seeing shows, and and word would spread fast when he was in the building, when he would walk into the entry and watch, observe what was happening, and then vanish. Um, the Prince Store in Uptown, um, right across from Calhoun Square and friends who worked at the Garden of Eden. He had a special sense that he would, that he would buy, they would roll in and, and get, um, just supporting local, local businesses and uh, just had a presence. Um, I have a friend who's a really phenomenal guitar player who was playing a, a music set and Prince came in the door and um, 
some guy came up to him and said, my boss, my boss wants to stand in. And he's like, oh, some guy wants to prove he's a rock star, I guess. <laughs> and later, and then he, then Prince entered the room and he hand, he's like, what, what key are we playing? G. So he, he, he played, he copied his riff and played for two minutes and then handed it off. That's one of my favorite, favorite stories. Yeah, I heard that story too, and that sense of like embodying that sound. It's like, that's so curious what you're doing. I need to try it on, and I'm going to be you and learn from that, that embodied, yeah, that art and, and being able to, yeah, share it. I'm Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Brittany. That was great. Um, I did see Prince at Excel. Uh, and with three other friends of mine, and I'd never seen them before, and it just blew my mind, of course, you know, and I, um, the thing that really gets me, though, is when I think about growing up, and as an adolescent in the early 80s, listening to Prince, and kind of going through all those conflicted feelings that adolescents have, you know, regarding our bodies and sexuality, and, you know, am I am I good enough as a person even? And so I remember um, hearing controversy for the first time. And that did it for me because I tell you, when I heard those lyrics, you know, I just can't believe all the things people say, am I black or white, am I straight or gay? You know, it was just like, oh my God. You know, it opened, it really did open this world up for me that I kind of, felt on the precipice of, but I didn't really have any words or kind of references, you know, as people to sort of look to. And when I heard him singing, and then of course the rest of the album and things that maybe I shouldn't have been listening to at such a young age, you know, but um, I did because I had older like uncles and cousins who had been listening to it and I finally had the chance to hear it and experience it for myself. And after I did, I felt some sort of emancipation. Like I felt that one day, you know, I'd be able to move my body the way I wanted and to, to express myself the way I wanted to express myself. And I think, oh, what was that Brittany said about horizons, about expanding horizons and not feeling like you have to apologize? That's what Prince did for me totally, yeah. Um, I'm not from here, I'm from the Boston area, and I was a Prince fan probably before some of you folks were even born. <laughs> um, I remember hearing 1999 on the radio because things have changed a lot since 1980. With, we listened to music on the radio and you went to the record store and you bought vinyl. And uh, disco was, was it. And then this guy comes up, Prince, and then Michael Jackson's Thriller was about to uh, come out. and. Uh, I just loved it, and I dragged my young employees to see Purple Rain at the movie theater. Uh, what I really loved about Prince was the uh, sophistication of the music, um, listening with headphones to uh, When Doves Cry and hearing a track with dogs barking. And I mean, people weren't doing stuff like that back then. Multi-track recording was becoming digital and becoming more sophisticated, but he really uh, took it to a, a, a new level. Um, and then, of course, Sheila E. on timbales, bringing in that whole Latin percussion and all the complexity of that. He really, uh, I think, was a, just a, a fabulous genius who, and a gift to all of us. You didn't tell them about the poster you had up on the inside of your closet door, the one in which he was rather scantily clad. The shower poster. Yeah, I remember it well. Um, well, I have been thinking a lot um, of late about community because we have really messed ours up in so many ways and I'm really worried and uh, looking for reasons to be optimistic and not finding very many. But right after Prince passed, I f learned really for the first time to some depth what all he had given to this 
community in a selfless way. And I didn't know about, I work in music, and I didn't know half, a third of, of what he was doing because he did do it so modestly and not and so sincerely and not looking for uh, recognition. He, so I was, it blew my mind how much he had done. And then the other thing that, I was, that I'm aware, well aware of working, as I say, in music and with students, um, he really did, I think you mentioned, worked with emerging artists and always trying to bring people forth and I have had the pleasure of seeing some of the students from our college uh, get into that orbit and be given opportunities that are, uh, well, phenomenal, as, as you've said. So the, another gift to the community, and I think we would have far less problems if we had people who thought more about others and how they can help others even while they themselves have everything they could ever want and could be totally wrapped up in themselves. Um, he cared so deeply about the community and I wish more of us acted as well and responsibly as he did. When I was speaking with some of the former dancers at Glam Slam, they were talking about how he gave them a living wage as a dancer and also access to costumes and props and that they um, were re really able to explore their craft and he gave them that respect and space. Um, uh, my name is Ellen Lansky and I don't really have a personal Prince story but I have a encounter um, with Prince that was like, it was like my first vision of seeing how a personality can be so powerful. Um, I first encountered Prince when I was 19 years old in the fall of 1980, so this is a really long time ago, and um, a friend of mine, I was at St. Kate's, and he was at St. Thomas, and we were in a class together, and he came over with these records um, and, you know, we listened to these Prince records. I think we, it was Dirty Mind and the, um, the blue one, you know, with the naked horse thing, uh, that one. Yeah, okay, you know what I'm talking about. And um, it, I was like, oh, okay, this is great. And he was really good looking, and I was sort of flattered that he was hanging out with me. But, like, what Prince did for him, for this, like, straight guy from St. Thomas in 1980, was gave him the courage and the ability to wear an earring and sing falsetto and be brave enough to have people look at him and, and think he was gay, which was not cool in 1980, um, and just be like, I'm not gay, I'm just like a guy who sings falsetto and likes Prince. Um, so it, that, was, that was really interesting. But then the, the next summer, um, there was a club in Minneapolis that some of you may know called Duffy's, and it was kind of a... Um, uh, you know, rock and roll, you know, with a lot of different kinds of bands coming through. And I was working there one night. I, I was a horrible um, cocktail person at the time. I was more interested in drinking. And, and so I was working on a Sunday night, and, the, and this band called The Persuasions was there. And they're, you know, they're like an a cappella, Motown, whatever. I mean, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of idiotic about this. I didn't really know who they were, but it's like, oh, well, they seem cool. And then all of a sudden, you know, you hear, right? Prince is here, Prince is here, Prince is here. And I saw like this tiny little person, this is the 80s, remember, in this giant leopard jacket walking up to the stage. And it was, it was a crowded club and everybody moved, you know, it was like the parting of the Red Seas. Everybody moved to let Prince through to see the persuasions. And it was just, it was beautiful. I knew I was in the presence of greatness even, even then. Any other stories? Ashley, do you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to touch upon a bit of what you said. Um, I remember reading Caroline Palmer's article several times. There's just something really intriguing about it. <laughs> I feel like you discover something new each time you read it. But um, I know um, with the dancers that were with Glam Slam, um, 
Colleen Newland was one of those dancers. In the article, she had said, you know, it didn't matter if I was this pasty, pale, kind of plain Jane um, dancer. What mattered was that Prince saw I could move and I could hold my own. And I always think that that's so relevant to whether you're a dancer or a poet or, you know, you, you sit at a desk every day. It just, it kind of hit home to me because it didn't really matter um, what the exterior was, it was basically what that, what soul was moving through you and what was getting you through, you know, your daily practices or your artistic vision. Um, and I find that so valuable as I move through, you know, the work that I do with my company and even just when I move through the work that I do at my desk job. Um, just staying true to who you are and choosing you and then giving to others. So I think that's kind of a continuous thing that I try and think of um, as simply as that. Um, and I do want to say just thank you to Brittany for such beautiful words. Um, they were lovely. And Craig, who was here, he had to step out. But um, I think kind of the interconnectivity between all of us is that um, we are enough and that we have to remember um, what legacy we want to leave behind and um, kind of what are we contributing to this community. So it's been really cool. Yeah, it makes me think of, um, in that article, how much he rehearsed and practiced and what Craig was talking about, the rehearsal that we don't, it seems so effortless and that it was just like a glove, the way he wore his, his uh, outfits, that it just was so seamless that that movement um, could come naturally and that it actually came from a lot of practice and a lot of intention and, and artistry. And um, I think often we're taught that, you know, you're just natural born talent and it's, there's nothing, you just were born that way. And, and, and even when you have natural born talent, it's, it's a ton of dedication and work and, and yeah. Any last thoughts before we call it? Thank you so much.